I think we're going to pause just for a second to load the PowerPoint, but our first presenter is going to be Ivan Fernandez from the University of Maine, who is both a Climate Council member and will be a co-chair of our Science and Technical Subcommittee. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is a bit of an overwhelming crowd. I'd take a big class of freshmen any day. Uh, <clears throat> it's an honor to be here, uh, Director Pingree. Commissioner Reed, thank you for uh, leading us off this morning, and of course, uh, thank you to our governor for providing the, the vision and leadership that uh, has all of this uh, taking place, and some faces here that I haven't seen in about eight years, uh, that, <laughs> that we can continue our work. So um, my charge is to talk a little bit about climate change and, and kind of get us all on the same page. We've got people from all walks of life that have, uh, are contributing and participating here today. Uh, and so that's the journey I'm going to take us on, obviously focusing, focusing uh, on uh, Maine. Before I do, though, um, oh, I can see my own slides. And I don't have a clicker, so I'm probably going to screw this up. Um, but uh, my first slide has a series of uh, covers from reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Probably everyone knows what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is, uh, but it's that international organization that gives us information about the changing uh, climate. Uh, and roughly every six years, they issue a report, actually a series of reports that deal with the physical science, adaptation, uh, mitigation, uh, summary for, uh, for policymakers. Uh, the first one was in 1990, uh, and the most recent was in 2013-2014 as a, uh, a set of reports. We knew exactly what the problem was in 1990. We knew exactly what we needed to do in 1990. So the part that hasn't changed is we haven't done anything yet about it. Uh, but we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about the complexity of it. Uh, and we're also beginning to live it in a very real way with a lot more to come. When we hear about the discussions of warming in Washington and in Paris and around the world and at the Committee of the Parties meetings, there almost always talking about the data that we get from this organization. And so it's global scale. And it's extremely valuable, uh, obviously, to guide the world in making decisions about climate change. Uh, but there's also a real need to have uh, local knowledge in, in moving agendas forward. This past year has been unique. Uh, and Director Pingree also already uh, referred to the report that was out yesterday, unique in the sense that IPCC released three special reports uh, this year. The first one's the one I'm going to talk about, which was last fall, I think in October, uh, uh, global warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade. There was also one uh, sometime in the summer having to do with uh, land use around the world, and the one yesterday having to do with the cryosphere and oceans. Uh, none of them are particularly uplifting. All of them are very dense uh, with the science, uh, but they're essential for us to understand what we're doing to our planet uh, and what we need to do going forward. Uh, this is kind of the iconic figure that came out of the report in the fall, uh, and it's important for a couple of uh, reasons. It got a lot of press. You may have heard aspects of it. I know, of course, uh, many of you have. Uh, and what it shows is that anthropogenic warming, that's the code for us, human warming, uh, putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, have warmed the planet at roughly one degrees centigrade. And so that's the um, the, the squiggly line, lots of noise, lots of interannual variability, uh, but clearly a, a certain slope and trajectory, and we're about, you know, two years beyond that, but on the same line. Uh, the bad news is that we're on a trajectory to go well past the 1.5 and 2 degree uh, centigrade targets uh, that were uh, the focus of that report to uh, define uh, and understand what are the consequences of warming to 1.5 degrees on the planet, and they're not good, uh, and then compare that to 2 degrees, uh, which is, of course, much worse. Uh, right now, we're on a trajectory for 3 or 4 degrees uh, or beyond. Um, the other thing that came out of that uh, report, uh, many things, but uh, is the fact that all of the anthropogenic greenhouse gases that we've loaded in the atmosphere to date if we could shut it all off this afternoon after we uh, hear from the governor, then th those would keep us probably below or near 1.5 degrees warming. So what's going to push us over the threshold is what we do between now and going forward. And what an auspicious day it is to be able to talk about that because we're here in order to address that very concern. Of course, so far we haven't done anything and uh, CO2 uh, em emissions broke a record in 2018. So uh, we have our work cut out for us going forward. 
this slide is my transition slide to make the point that that information is really, of course, valuable. It's on a global scale. But for us to make decisions here in Maine, uh, we need to have local knowledge. We need to have information about the climate change as it's taking place in our state. Uh, and we need to understand the resources. And you could show that slide to anyone oh, probably in the country, and you would recognize you know, Downey's blueberries and aristic potatoes and uh, spruce fir and lobster boats and, um, and, and even Paul Bunyan, regardless of what Minnesota says, uh, tells you that we are Maine. Uh, it's both uh, you know, perhaps a travel log, but it's also making the point that a lot of the information, a lot of the approaches and tactics to address climate change from both mitigation and adaptation really need to be tailored to who we are here in Maine. And so the focus of uh, some of the work that we've done in evaluating the climate has been specific to Maine uh, to be able to give us the information we need to move forward. In order to achieve that, about a dozen years ago, um, we got together primarily led by the Climate Change Institute uh, and Maine Sea Grant. A uh, number of people in the room were involved in it, uh, Andy Pershing, uh, Sean Burkle, our state climatologist, uh, in putting this, these reports together. The most recent one was in 2015. And I, in order to give you an information about climate change in Maine, I'm just going to run through this, what I call a dashboard, which is the highlights of the findings of that report, which were designed to address how is climate change happening in our state, and to the extent that we could, what do we think uh, lies ahead. And so let's run down the dashboard. To no one's surprise, it's getting warmer. Now, I've just flipped to Fahrenheit. So this we were talking about centigrade with IC, IPCC. but. You, we all live and work day to day around here in Fahrenheit, and so our report uh, uses those units. Uh, we've warmed by about three degrees in the last century, three degrees being the real deal. This is in projections. These are measured changes. So that middle column is actually what we've experienced here in the state. We also then projected to 2050 because 2050 is not that far away. We're buying, buying tractors today that we expect to still be running in 2050. Uh, so it informs our decisions uh, right now. And we expect another one to three degrees uh, to uh, warming by just the mid-century. Graphs the graphs are more dramatic if we go to the end of the century, uh, but we chose the, the, the midpoint. Uh, the growing season is getting warmer. We all know that. Uh, spring arrives earlier. Uh, winter ar arrives later by about two weeks. Lots of variation in that with about two more weeks to come. Uh, we have almost no high heat index days up till uh, the recent times. Uh, this is vacation land. We don't want high heat index days. Um, but we're seeing more of them, and we expect 1 to 15, depending on where you are, uh, by mid-century with more along the coast because of the nature of our, our, our climate divisions. Um, the big surprise, to some extent, had to do with precipitation. And I say that the climate scientists knew that we would have more precipitation as climate warmed. Um, but uh, we didn't think about that uh, in our everyday lives. And if anything has changed the opinion of Mainers, I would propose it has been the change in precipitation. Uh, we, it's wetter, we have more rain, and we get more rain in these big intense events uh, that have pretty dramatic impacts on our roads and our fields and our, uh, our lives. Um, and we will see more of that to come. We've had 13% increase in precipitation so far. Uh, as it gets warmer, no surprise, uh, less of the precipitation is frozen. It's melted, so we've lost about 7% of the um, uh, snow, or snowpack. There's lots of ways to measure that, uh, with 20 or to 40% to come in the decades ahead. The closer you get to 32 degrees, the more likely things are going to melt, and we keep rising, getting uh, uh, warmer and warmer. Uh, more loss uh, along the coastal division because it's, of course, warmer there. Uh, ocean temperature, uh, Director Pingree stole my thunder, but uh, you'd have to have been on another continent to not know. The Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the world's oceans. Uh, Dr. Pershing and his teams brings us that. I will say no more because we're going to hear more uh, from him in a few minutes. And uh, of course, sea level rise is occurring. Uh, about uh, two-thirds of a foot so far with uh, more to come, potentially a lot more to come. We've got about 3,500 miles of coast, not counting the islands. So Maine is ex particularly vulnerable uh, to this vector of change. One thing that's not on that dashboard is ocean acidification because we haven't been monitoring ocean acidification uh, the way we've been measuring a lot of these other things. The state of Maine certainly has mobilized to address it, and there's a lot going on. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit about it, I think, from Bill Mook, uh, the impacts of, of some of the, uh, the uh, 
change in ocean acidification. So it's real. Uh, we just didn't have the historical data to, um, to demonstrate it here. So clearly, there's change taking place over time. I wanted to just uh, take a minute to also present uh, th this slide from our first uh, 2009 report um, that, uh, although the date's wrong apparently, um, that uh, Maine has three climate divisions, officially rec recognized by the National Weather Service, uh, coastal, interior, and northern, and we have a lot of spatial variability, so it's not monolithic. One size doesn't fit all here in Maine. Uh, and we have as much climate variation in four degrees of latitude across Maine, from the oceans to the mountains to north to the south, uh, as we do across 20 degrees of latitude in Europe. So there's a lot of spatial variability, and these different regions are changing at different rates uh, and in different ways. And so it's a complex uh, challenge in order to understand how is change taking place across our landscape and, of course, uh, across our waters, uh, and how do we address it. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the standard slide that follows the last one, which says, uh, is it having an effect? And you all wouldn't be in this room today if it wasn't having an effect. So we know it's having an effect on all sorts of aspects of, uh, of our life here in Maine. We talk about adaptation and mitigation, adaptation being what do we do to minimize the negative, and in some cases, take advantage of the positive, um, and mitigation being what do we do to decrease the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, this little circle of, uh, of um, uh, sectors is just my way of dividing up the world, and you can do it a lot of different ways. But we could have a whole day workshop that would be fascinating, and we've done some of those, uh, to talk about how climate change in Maine is impacting any one of these, agriculture, forestry, human health, marine fisheries, uh, communities, businesses, security, meaning uh, particularly when there's instability around the world that's partially driven by droughts. Uh, and food insecurity that comes back home to roost in our sons and daughters uh, in the military, uh, and of course, recreation and tourism and all that goes with that. Um, there's a lot about adaptation that we focus on uh, in all of these arenas, as well as mitigation. Of course, mitigation has to do with how we use energy, uh, how much fossil fuels we put into the atmosphere, but it also has to do with what we're uh, talking about uh, a lot lately, having to do with uh, natural climate solutions, meaning our farms and our forests. We've got seven or 8,000 farms in Maine, and if we build soil health on these farms, we build their resilience, we sequester carbon out of the atmosphere. The best gadget to uh, take up CO2 from the atmosphere that we have so far as a tree, and we have about 24 billion of them in Maine. Um, so there's lots of opportunities to look at how we move forward in both adaptation and mitigation uh, across our state. Uh, my 10 minutes is almost up, so I'm uh, almost done here. Uh, this is a plot of greenhouse gases, and uh, since I was uh, charged to give you the broad <laughs> overview of the science, uh, nothing you've looked at so far, I don't think, uh, had actual concentrations of carbon dioxide. Uh, many in the room will recognize that as the relatively famous Keeling curve, famous because Charles Keeling uh, was running the observatory in Mauna Loa, uh, and uh, decades ago brought us uh, scientific evidence of rising CO2 in the atmosphere, and so it's quite real. Um, you can see the bend in that is not just bad graphics, but that's a sign of acceleration, uh, as in so many other aspects of the changing climate. Um, of course, the atmosphere, we're in one big bathtub. We're on one blue marble, and we're all surrounded by the same atmosphere. So we're all contributing to it, and we're all receiving it. And if you get online, look at Noah's got this little app, a year in, of CO2, and you can see it swirling and mixing as it goes uh, and changing concentrations as it goes throughout the year. I say that because it's not some faraway thing that's happening. That's happening here. If we look at the data from the Tall Tower site in Argyle, Maine, so just up the road, um, the upper plot, these are on a, a shorter time scale because they weren't monitors as long, so they start kind of up by, by the very end. Uh, but that's the rising CO2 concentration. Uh, methane, which is about 30 times as, uh, the global warming potential. Nitrous oxide, which is about 300 times. And uh, sulfur hexafluoride, which is about 23,000 times um, the uh, global warming potential uh, as CO2. Fortunately, these are all uh, dramatically uh, lower in concentration, so we are still focusing on CO2, but not solely. We need to focus uh, on all of them. Uh, the CO2 plot uh, is, uh, if I plotted that uh, on that uh, uh, Mount Aloha curve, it would be just the end part of it. It would run parallel and slightly north. Uh, we're, the, we're in the pipeline of the northeast, so we have a little higher concentrations of CO2. Uh, 
So uh, let me finish up by saying uh, climate change is accelerating in Maine. Is rarely the only factor, uh, so it's always complex, but it affects everything. Uh, from away affects us here, and what we do here affects away. We're all part of this in, together. Uh, it brings both risks and opportunities. I underline risks because this is not a 50-50 split screen thing. Uh, the risks far outweigh the opportunities, but we'd be crazy to ignore the opportunities as well. And so there's uh, lots to do in that regard. Uh, it demands science-informed, cost-effective policy. I've been involved with some of this with uh, EPA over my life, and uh, time and again when we do the evaluation of science-informed policy, particularly around the Clean Air Act, it pays back to the American public many times the cost of implementation. Uh, even if at the beginning you hear it's going to ruin the economy, it doesn't. And it's the same thing with CO2. And then finally, business as usual is not an option. Thank you. Professor, if I could ask you to take a seat at the head table here, we may be subjecting you to questions at some point. Um, and I have to say, if I absolutely have to receive discouraging news, there's no one I'd rather receive it from than you. <laughs> um, I'd like to invite uh, up to the podium Melissa Law, an organic farmer from Wyndham, to share with us her experiences. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you to Director Pingree and Commissioner Reed and Commissioner Beal for inviting a farmer to be a part of this council. Um, and thank you to Ivan for summarizing the science. Um, the data he shared shows that the state of Maine is already facing rising temperatures of both air and water, as well as rising sea levels and changes in precipitation patterns. And it's very clear that these changes will only accelerate in the next 50 years. I'm here to talk about how these changes will impact the industry I work in and the way I run my business, and to give you a real world example of how climate change is affecting people here in Maine. My name is Melissa Law, and I'm one of four owners of Bumble Root Organic Farm, a certified organic vegetable and flower farm in Wyndham, Maine. We're reaching the end of our fifth growing season, and even at this early stage in the life of our business, we're already confronting extreme weather events. Last July, we had our first ever hailstorm sweep through our farm, and it wiped out our onion crop and damaged many of our field crops. The farmers that hay our fields have lived and farmed in our neighborhood for 70 years, and they told us they had never seen anything like that storm. The hailstorm had significant financial implications for our young business, and we had no choice but to pass the loss of some of our staple crops onto our customers. Onions and peppers were no longer available to our CSA members, restaurant accounts, or farmers market regulars. In response, we've begun to transition to growing many of our high value crops in greenhouses, like the one in this photograph. Not only do these tunnels protect our crops from extreme weather events and new pest pressure brought on by changing weather patterns, they extend our growing season into the winter months and provide a more stable environment for our crops. This in turn creates more predictable data for us to base our planning on and helps us feed our community year round. As organic farmers, soil health and sustainable practices have always been a focus for us, but we're realizing more and more how critical these practices will be in, adapt in adapting to climate change. Building healthy soil sequesters carbon from the atmosphere, prevents erosion, and increases crop yields and nutrient density. Healthier soil translates to healthier food, healthier communities, and more resilient farm businesses. The strength of our local food systems depends on the adaptability and resilience of farmers in the face of changing weather patterns and more extreme growing conditions. Agriculture has to be a part of the solution. As a young farmer, I view climate change as one of the most significant challenges my business will face in the decades to come. I'm here to be a voice for the next generation of food producers because we're on the front lines of this fight. In order to preserve Maine's vibrant culture of family farming, this council and its working groups must find ways to support and incentivize farmland protection and regenerative farming practices, along with reduced greenhouse gas emissions and renewable energy goals. The future of our state's food system depends on the actions we take now. Thank you.
Thank you, Melissa, and thank you for your willingness to serve on the Climate Council. I'd like to introduce Nate Webb from Maine's Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Nate is a member of our Natural and Working Lands Working Group. Thank you, Commissioner Reed um, and Director Pingree for inviting me here today. Um, as Commissioner Reed mentioned, I'm the, the Wildlife Director of Maine Fish and Wildlife, and this is an issue that our agency has taken very seriously for quite a long time. Um, it's something we've been working on for many, many years. We have many staff, a few of whom are in the room, that um, really have a lot more expertise on these, this issue and how it affects our wildlife than I do, so I'd like to acknowledge a couple of them before I get started. One of those is Amanda Cross and Philip de Maynardier, who I believe are, are both here today as well and will be involved in this process. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with our agency or aren't familiar with all of the various things we work on, um, we do obviously interact with some high profile issues. You know, we regulate deer hunting, we regulate moose hunting and those types of things, but our scope of responsibility is actually much, much broader than that. We're responsible for all inland fisheries and wildlife in, in the state. We let DMR handle the marine stuff, which we view as less important. Um, <laughs> We're also responsible for the habitats that all of those species uh, call home. And we're also responsible for the interaction between people and wildlife. And that can be in the form of outdoor recreation, whether that's hunting or fishing or bird watching. Um, it can also be in the form of human health and safety. Think vehicle collisions, think Lyme disease, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, it can also be in the form of conflicts that people may experience with wildlife. So the scope of our responsibility as an agency is extremely broad. Climate change really intersects all aspects of what we do, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so just to, to get things started, a little bit more about Maine's wildlife. We have an extremely diverse suite of wildlife in our state. Most of you are probably familiar with some of our more charismatic species, our birds and mammals. Um, we also have you know, a fairly robust number of reptile and amphibian species. And we have, um, at least our best estimates, over 30,000 invertebrate species as well. And those range from dragonflies and bumblebees to freshwater mussels and a whole host of, of different taxonomic groups. So it's an extremely um, important and you know, very um, high responsibility that we take very seriously to be stewards of all of these species. So managing and conserving those species, um, you know, it can be kind of an insurmountable challenge. Um, we're a relatively small agency. We do have a, a large number of organizations that we partner with, many of whom are also represented in this room. But to make our work manageable, we go through strategic planning efforts, which we recently completed in 2015 through the development of our State Wildlife Action Plan. And this was developed in collaboration with over 100 conservation partners, again, many of whom are, are here today, to really identify the most at-risk species in our state where conservation attention should be focused and identify the threats to those species and the solutions to some of those challenges that those species are taking. This was a monumental effort, and it really guides the work that we do as an agency um, for a, a large number of species that we work with. So that planning effort, which took about two years, uh, a lot of work to, to develop, identified almost 380 at-risk species um, across the state. I will mention that this does include marine species as well. DMR was a, a partner in this planning effort. One third of those species are vulnerable to climate change. So of the most at-risk species in our state, the most prevalent tangible threat or impact to those species is climate change. The habitats that those species rely on are also uh, extremely vulnerable in some cases to climate change, and that varies quite a bit depending on which habitats that you're talking about. Certainly our coastal ecosystems and habitats are highly vulnerable due to the potential for sea level rise, and we'll hear more about that as well. Um, there's also high vulnerability for some of our cold water ecosystems, and that has impacts for aquatic life, species like brook trout that I'll talk more about in a few minutes. Montane forests, our mountainous uh, forest ecosystems are also highly vulnerable. Our alpine habitats, peatlands, and boreal forests, all of which we expect to be uh, impacted in a significant way by climate change, and those changes will impact the species that live in those habitats. Just a tangible example, one of the projections for changes to habitats that we expect to occur in our state is a transition from spruce fir boreal forest to 
Maple Beach and bir uh, birch forests in the northern part of the state, and that will impact the species that are able to exist in, in that portion of Maine. In terms of wildlife species, this is a very short list of vertebrate species, uh, many of which you may be familiar with. These are some of the higher profile ones that are highly vulnerable to climate change, um, both globally and in their range here in the state of Maine. Um, so some pretty high profile species up there, Canada lynx, which is a threatened species, moose, uh, snowshoe hare, a large number of bird species as well. So I just wanted to run through a few tangible real world examples that we're actually seeing and documenting and experiencing here in our state. One that has gotten a lot of media attention and one which we've devoted a lot of resources to researching recently is the effects of parasites on our state's moose population. We do have a very robust moose population in the state, uh, one of the, the, the highest, uh, most abundant populations in the lower 48 in the United States. However, we are starting to see significant impacts of parasites, winter tick, in particular on the health um, and population dynamics of our moose herd. To give you an example of that, we have a study area in western Maine in the Greenville and Jackman area. And for the past six years, um, we have seen that over 50% of calves that are alive in January die um, by the end of May. And that's primarily due to winter ticks. So survival of those calves in that part of the state is extremely low. Um, we expect that issue to increase as climate warms. And we're already seeing fairly dramatic longitudinal, longitudinal differences across uh, our state in the um, relative impacts of, of that parasite on our moose population. And climate plays a big role in the abundance of, of winter ticks. Another example, uh, Bicknell's thrush, for those of you that aren't familiar with this species, it's one of my favorite bird species. Um, it lives in some great places, high elevation habitats, um, sort of sky islands or, or how we often refer to them. Its breeding range is already fairly limited um, in northern New England and the Maritimes and, and in Quebec. Um, as climate warms, we expect the habitats uh, on which the species relies for breeding to move upslope and be entirely lost in some cases. Um, the projections for this species are that about 50% of its breeding range will be lost over the next 30 years. Um, so we're expecting fairly dramatic declines in the species um, over, over uh, the next three or four decades. Another high profile example, and uh, this is actually our fisheries director, Francis Brodigum, with a pretty nice brook trout. Um, for those of you that, uh, that aren't aware, um, you know, Maine is the last stronghold for native wild brook trout in the United States. Um, we really have something special with brook trout in our state. They are very reliant on high quality water. Um, they're also reliant on cold water. They are a cold water dependent species. When stream or lake or pond temperatures are cre increase above about 68 to 70 degrees, um, those waters are no longer amenable for the species to inhabit. Um, we are expecting as climate continues to warm and we see impacts on stream and lake and pond temperature that this species will decline in abundance. Um, this is actually a marine species, but I thought I'd throw it up there. It's a great example. Uh, this is the green crab. Um, we are seeing more and more prevalence in terms of invasive species in Maine. Um, again, this is a, a great example from the marine world. The species, um, it does better with warmer waters. Um, it has significant impacts on marine food webs and impacts on um, the natural resource-based economy along the Maine coast. And there are other examples um, inland as well, but this is a really tangible one that we're already seeing impacts from and, and have for a number of years. Um, on human health, I think everyone is probably aware of the increases in prevalence in tick-borne diseases in Maine. Um, this is, to us, a, a wildlife issue that we intersect with because we manage the hosts for these species, the, the ticks that are carrying the, these diseases. Um, and this map is just a simple demonstration for Lyme disease of the increase in prevalence of that disease over the past 10 or so years. And other diseases um, that affect human health um, have followed a similar pattern. And um, just as a, a side note, we have many, many staff in our agency that um, have been directly impacted by this. We spend a lot of time outdoors working in the field. Um, we feel this uh, it's very close to home for us um, in terms of some of these impacts from tick-borne diseases. <coughs> 
So to, to summarize some key take home messages, um, climate plays a key role in the distribution and abundance of wildlife across, um, across the world and in Maine. We expect to see large shifts in geographic distribution for many species within our state. Maine is fairly unique in that we are at the northern edge of the range for many species and at the southern edge of the range for many others. So there will be winners and losers as the climate changes and as the climate warm, warms and as habitats change. Um, many of those winners, those species that do better with a warming climate will be what we refer to as weedy or invasive species. So those are species that are habitat generalists, have high reproductive potential, um, and can kind of you know, live across a, a diversity of habitats. Those that are most vulnerable to climate change are those that are reliant on climate vulnerable ecosystems that have a very narrow habitat niche um, and that live at, at, in habitats that will be most impacted by climate change. We do expect that some species that are at the southern edge of their range in Maine will be lost from our state over time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nate. That was great. We will next hear from Bob Marvini, who is the highly respected uh, state geologist for the state of Maine and the director of the Maine Geological Survey. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak about sea level rise, um, both globally and in Maine. and. Um, what it means for our coastal communities or, and just uh, Maine in general. And I want to I, I thank Pete Slavinsky, who did all the heavy lifting on the graphics and, and all the much of the work behind what we know about sea level rise in Maine. Now, geologists will tell you that sea level is always changing. <clears throat> it's been changing for millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, even billions of years. It's probably better for me to not go that far back and focus a little bit uh, closer to our current time. So I'm just showing a graph of sea level over the last about 13,000 years in Maine. And as you all know, we only just recently came out of a big glacial episode with uh, glacial ice covering all of Maine and well offshore. And so this graphic just shows um, where sea level, level has been since the ice has melted um, from our coast and then farther inland. And I'll tell you that many scientists have contributed work to this graph of sea level change over many decades of work. And thanks to Joe Kelly, who's here, and others who have spent a big part of their careers pulling this all together so we can have these nice summaries. So 13,000 years ago, sea level was much higher here. The, as the, the, the glaciers melted away from the coast, the crust of the earth was actually depressed by the weight of all that ice, such that sea level invaded the, the coastal areas quite a ways inland, and sea level was much higher than today. But it fell rapidly as the crust rebounded and gets to that low stand around 11,000 years ago. So those numbers need to be a little bit adjusted, but. Good enough for this presentation. Um, so that was, that was the rebound, but glacial ice was still melting uh, 10,000 years and, and or so ago across the globe. So after the rebound happened, sea level continued to rise as glacial ice melted and continued at a slower rate through uh, about 9,000 through 5,000 years ago. You'll see where um, on the right side, it shows um, sea level at about one millimeter per year. That was for about 5,000 years. And that's when many or most of our coastal beaches developed during that period where it was very gentle, gradual sea level rise. And in the last 100 years, we go to the 1.8 millimeters per year, almost twice what it had been doing for 5,000. So what are the causes of sea level rise, global sea level rise? Well, so this chart shows um, all, the, all the contributors to sea level rise, but let's focus on the two key ones. That's melting glacial ice, on land um, ice, not floating ice. And that contributes about half of 
the water that we that that causes sea level rise. The uh, the other forty percent comes from thermal expansion of the ocean, so heated up, and it expands. The other ten percent are a bunch of other factors. They're they're important locally, but for overall global, they only add up to 10%. So it's really just, we really need to focus on melting of, of glacial ice and thermal expansion of the oceans. So here's a graphic that shows how the thermal expansion and added water from melting ice contributes to what we see as sea level rise today. And so the bottom, that red line is thermal expansion. Um, you can see that it's variable over the years. Added water, the same thing. Add the two of them together, and it creates that purple line at the top. And you'll see that that purple line you know, matches very well to the satellite data on actual sea level rise. So here's two independently derived graphs of independent variables that, when combined, really show us what's happening in terms of sea level rise. So let's look right uh, or closer, and we'll look at Maine and see what's been happening here. We're very fortunate to have uh, three tide gauges that have been in place for a long period of time. Here's the, here's the Portland tide gauge, um, uh, over 100 years of record here. And it, it's great that somebody thought we might need to track sea level over a long period of time. If we'd only thought of this a few years ago, we wouldn't be able to do much, uh, project much at all in terms of how sea level has changed. So the uh, blue line is the uh, average uh, sea level change over, uh, over 100 years. And that's about 1.8 millimeters per year. It doesn't sound like much, but added up over 100 years, and it, and it adds up to um, 7 inches per century. If we, and of course, there's a lot of variability. There's a lot of factors that lead to our local sea level. If we look at the last 25 years, the red points and the red line, that's at about 2.8 millimeters per year. And so significant, significantly uh, greater uh, rate of sea level rise than in the past 100 years. And we can see that sea level can change very abruptly. That circled dot there is 2010, and that's when there was a phenomenon in the northern Atlantic Ocean circulation that changed dramatically, and I'm not going to go into the details of that, but that ocean circulation change resulted in much higher sea level in the state of Maine. And the consequences of that are increased erosion. So here's Higgins Beach um, in 2010. The erosion was a combination of that high, very high sea level and the um, ocean storms that we experienced that year. And this is exposing peat. That layer in the foreground and some logs are peat that formed many thousands of years ago that was subsequently overridden by the beach deposits and now exposed on the coast of Maine by this very extreme uh, sea level and s winter storms. Now we, we can't we can we can see erosion along the coast of Maine in many many places. We can't go to one place and say ah this is all due to sea level rise. Sea level is just sea level rise is just going to be a compounding factor on top of the other factors that already cause um, coastal erosion, like the coastal storms and 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 waves that come with them, storm surge, storm tide, and so forth. So, but sea level will continue to rise, and it's going to continue to be a problem. So let's look at some scenarios for sea level rise. And this was out of a 2017 NOAA report showing various scenarios for sea level rise. The black line on the left is, is a historic record of about one foot per century or thereabouts. The pink line in the middle is the satellite data that shows what we've actually measured. So it, it meets the, uh, the, you know, the other uh, tide gauge and, and other data very well in the middle there. And then all the other colored lines represent various scenarios. Now the one foot would be just taking that black line and projecting it to, right, to the right at 2100. 
And that's pretty unlikely. That doesn't account for anything that we're seeing. 1.6 feet really is what we would get if, if the only factor were thermal expansion of the oceans. So by 2100, 1.6 feet of sea level rise. 3.3 feet would be if we look at all the melting glaciers, thermal expansion, and apply a lot of mitigation to uh, uh, greenhouse gas output. That would get us to, you know, very aggressive action would get us still to th almost three and a half feet of sea level rise. And the other scenarios are um, the same factors plus less and less mitigation, the top being basically just business as usual, and that's where we'll be in 2100. So that's globally. Um, that NOAA report also had regional uh, examples. So here's for the, for the, uh, the main region, um, showing those same kinds of curves, showing our Portland tide gauge data at the bottom. And um, Maine, the, the curves are a little bit higher because um, this factors in changes to uh, ocean circulation, which will uh, greatly affect the, the Gulf of Maine. So storms and, and uh, storm surges are other factors that um, we have to consider when we're talking about climate change and coastal impacts. So what do we, what do we know about this? So here's just a graphic that shows what we mean when we're talking about storm surge and storm tides. Storm surge is the difference between a predicted tide level and the actual tide, tide level that is caused by a storm. So the, the storm low pressure causes more ocean water to gather where there's storms, um, and the, the uh, wind action uh, sets up the water higher. So those things contribute to storm surge. And then the storm so tide is what we actually measure. It's the, it's the actual tide measured during storms. So in this example, the storm surge is four feet and on, on top of a, of a high tide of 10. So we, we get a storm tide of 14 feet. So let's look at then storm tides. We're not gonna focus on storm surge, but storm tides in Portland over 100 years of time. And so on the, the left, those are numbers of years uh, interval between these typical water levels. So one year, so it's 100% chance that every year we're going to get a water level of 11.7 feet. And uh, there's a 20% chance of 12.6 and so forth. Let's look at, uh, and then we get down to the 1% chance, 14.1 feet. That, that means typically there'd be 100 years between these types of storms. Um, if we look at 10%, the 10%, so every 10 years we typically get 12.9 feet. There's only a little over one foot difference between 12.9 and 14.1. So we add a foot of sea level rise to, uh, to our oceans and the water levels that we typically would experience only 1% of the time or once in 100 years is now happening every 10 years. So that's one big consequence for our coastal communities is dealing with these much higher tides. Let's look at what happens in Portland, nuisance tides. So there's a lot of times when it's blue sky out and the roads are flooded because it's one of those king tide situations. We have one coming up very soon in this next week that will cause some minor coastal flooding. So how often does this type of thing happen? So here's a graphic that just shows how often in hourly measurements that tide gauge in Portland is above 12 feet. And starting in 2012 and going to, to 2018. And, uh, I think everybody can see that the incidence of that is increasing. The average there is about five times a year, um, but it's been much more in uh, recent years. And the highest uh, bar there is in 2010, that year with a very high sea level, uh, over 25 events during the, the course of the year. Now, what would happen if we just added one foot of sea level rise and looked at this graphic again? How many times per year, just think about that, how many times per year do you think Portland would have to deal with these floods? And here's, here's the graph of adding that 
one foot of sea level rise, just to that old, that prior chart, just add a foot to every measurement and, and regraph it, and it comes out 67 times per year on average instead of five times a year. So that's a real uh, impact of sea level rise that all of our coastal areas are going to have to address in some way or another. We can look specifically at areas that might be inundated. Uh, here's during a, a hurricane uh, down at, uh, where is that? Where is that, Pete? Kennebunk Port. Kennebunk. Yep. Um, showing, showing just, uh, you know, people fascinated by all the, the, the big waves. So we, we can look at the various sea level uh, rise scenarios and actually map them on the landscape now because we have uh, LIDAR elevation data sets that give us excellent uh, elevation data that we can use to model the impacts of sea level rise. And so here's a graphic. The colors are not very good on this screen. Here's a graphic that shows the Portland area with the various scenarios of sea level rise. So the, the blue colors in there are the lower levels. So you can already, already see by 1.2 and 1.6 feet of sea level rise, there's areas along marginal way that are going to be flooded out. Um, and when we get into the uh, higher scenarios, into the green and yellow colors, we can see that there's a huge impact in Portland. And we have mapped this along the entire coast of Maine. You can go to our viewer and look at any area of interest and, um, and uh, see for yourself what the impacts of sea level rise will be. This formed the basis for the tool that TNC put up that looks at the very detailed impacts of sea level rise on, on economics and so forth. So um, it's, it's very, and, and this can also, this tool can also be used to just look at storm surge and, uh, and, and storm effects. So um, it's a very useful tool and I encourage you all to go look at it. So thank you very much for your time and uh, I look forward to the conference. Thanks, Bob. I should note that Bob's not just a Climate Council member, he's also co-chairing with Professor Fernandez, the Science and Technical Subcommittee. So now we're going to hear from Judy Cooper East, correct? Judy is a Climate Council member and the uh, Executive Director of the Washington County Council of Governments. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Reed. Director Pingree, I also want to echo how honored and delighted I am to be a part of all of this. Uh, so I'm going to take you to an ongoing story in Down East Maine in the town of Machias. Quick orientation, the uh, photo on the lower, your left, um, is uh, the 1880s. This is by no means a um, pristine uh, shoreline. Downtown Machias in current days is on the uh, left-hand side of this, uh, this photo. Uh, this, these were the, the lumber um, uh, loading docks. This notch uh, where, where the uh, ships came in is on the uh, flood maps I've got up there, is on the, uh, the lower left. So if you go up to the four maps, I don't expect you to see that detail. I really just want you to focus on the blue and the red. Um, so the notch um, at the lower left-hand corner of, of the upper left-hand side is that same notch um, in the, back in the 1880s. That, uh, so left-hand side upper, is the current FEMA flood map. So downtown Machias, uh, base flood elevation, they're already seeing flooding today. Um, so there were many partners in this project to date. Um, uh, my agency, the town, University of Maine, Machias, uh, several consulting firms, and then the coastal program. We ha got a coastal communities grant to look at um, uh, alternatives for a seawall that would protect the downtown, so basically running along that shoreline where the old um, crib work still exists from these, these old um, uh, lumber docking, or whatever you call that, uh, weirs. Um, and then it, it, the, the seawall would also protect critical infrastructure, tie into the dike, and protect the sewage treatment plant. 
We analyzed, um, or what we were looking at was to be able to apply for funding to take this to construction, and FEMA, if, if they're the ones who will be part of the funding mechanism, requires a cost-benefit analysis. So we looked at the um, various alternatives uh, going from current conditions to below uh, current conditions is base flood elevation plus two feet over to the far side base flood elevation plus four feet and then plus six feet so essentially the blue becomes what is flooded and those red um, outlines are the structures that would be flooded by those flood waters. So we did depth damage analyses on what would be at different flood stages, the damage to the buildings, the damage to the contents, lost business time, lost employment, so that we could compare the cost of, of alternative structures to the benefits from not flooding those structures. Um, because this structure, a seawall, is a 50 to 80 year um, investment, um, you have to decide what is the target of sea level rise that you're working toward. We chose base flood elevation plus four. Um, and um, what that did is, is provide uh, the impacts to critical infrastructure and structures and balanced the, the cost of the structure, the seawall, sea against the benefits to be obtained. Where we stand right now with this is we submitted the results of this study to FEMA to apply for pre-disaster mitigation advance assistance planning grant funds. <laughs> And um, we will find out very soon whether we will get those. And what that will allow us to do is to take the, the, the it's a $200,000 ask to do the geotechnical analyses um, to determine what's needed for, because you're creating a basin when you're creating a, a, a seawall to actually pump out and have backflow devices. They need backflow devices now. But in addition to that, um, the living shoreline opportunities, which would be actually on the far side and maybe downstream, uh, landowner contact permitting, final design, and, and engineering, so that we can then apply for more FEMA funding, uh, actual pre-disaster mitigation construction funding. Um, CDBG will probably play a role because incorporated into the seawall is a river walk. Um, I've just condensed an enormous amount of work into three minutes, I think. There's a website at the bottom where you can get considerably more detail about all of the various assumptions. Um, and I just want to uh, give a shout out to uh, the University of Maine at Machias, Tora Johnson. I think Tora's here. The work that she did with her students. Hey, Tora. Um, as well as to Annie Fuchs at the Maine Emergency Management Agency. We put together this application to FEMA during the shutdown last January, and um, as well as to uh, Barney Baker at Baker Design Associates. Uh, we've talked about the level of uh, expertise in Maine that exists in the agencies, in the nonprofit, and in business, and I would also like to really underscore the depth and breadth and expertise that exists in the consulting community. It's enormous, and so we really have something to work on here, to work with here, and I think that what we've done here is transferable to other municipalities in the rest of Maine. Thanks. Thanks, Judy. That was great. We're now going to be hearing from Bill Mook from Mook Sea Farms. Uh, Bill is a member of our Coastal and Marine Working Group, and also, I understand, one of the stars of a just-released TNC documentary on the effects of climate change. <laughs> so, it may not look like it, but uh, we shellfish farmers are canaries in the coal mine. 2009, uh, in our hatchery, our oyster hatchery, we had devastating losses to our larvae. Uh, it took us uh, quite a long time, number of years actually, to figure it out, but the losses totaled over that time span hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it turns out it was because our, uh, our seawater that we were pumping in had become more acidic. So now, in order for us to have regular production in our hatchery, we literally have to put tums in the water every time we do a larval water change. And it's amazing how well those tums work, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, severe storms are increasingly damaging our uh, infrastructure and our gear. 
Uh, there was the, the big storm in, uh, I think it was May of 2016. Uh, it was a 60 mile an hour winds with a huge, uh, some storm surge and a storm tide. I'm glad to learn the difference. Uh, and, but what I do know is that it pulled out a bunch of moorings and we had a tangle of gear with our oyster cages, uh, which were pictured, I think, in one of Ivan's slides, uh, piled three or four high. It took our river crew two weeks of work every day to get them untangled and back into place. We, and we had to invest in bigger moorings. Um, because of warming seawater and air temperatures, we now have to immediately cool down our oysters every time we harvest them during the warm months in order for them to be safe to eat. Um, and although the, clim the link to climate change is less clear, harmful algal blooms are increasing. We see repeated reports of this every year now. And um, even with all that, uh, one thing that is really clear is this link between the harvesting closures that we experience and climate change through the increase in very heavy precipitation. And this graph on your left is um, a graph showing the Area 500 closures. And these are broad swaths of the coast, courtesy of the Marine Resources Department. I pestered a lot of your staff to get the data over the last few years. Uh, <laughs> but but um, what an Area 500 closure is, whenever growing areas are impacted by a two-inch rainfall in 24 hours, the, the state closes those growing areas so that they can then go out and retest them. And during that time span, we can't harvest our shellfish, so we lose those sales. It's hard to get them back. And, and this is kind of a classic climate change curve with a lot of year-to-year -year variability, but with an unmistakable trend in the upward direction. Um, the science is really clear. Uh, <laughs> these are just opening salvos in an epic struggle that we're facing. And uh, so rather than, than dwell on the negative, uh, I want to point out that, you know, these also, you know, problems are really the raw material uh, uh, for innovation. And the picture on the right is a very small example of that, of what we did in our company. Fa seeing this curve, this is, I would call this actionable intelligence. So we wound up investing in a facility, we invested a lot of money in this, and those bins, stacked bins on the right with uh, uh, Sean, our, our uh, company Viking, uh, standing next to them. And basically what we figured out was if we built a land-based facility, we could uh, sequester uh, an inventory away from the Damascus River ahead of these closures and be able to ship throughout them. And that, you know, that's something that, that that's a, an example of what we could do here as a state in many ways. And it gives us a market advantage because all of our wholesale customers and all the people depending on getting our oysters in their raw bars all over the country know that we are a dependable supply because we can avoid those closures. Finally, I just want to say how relieved I am to be here. Uh, after singing that canary song for so many years, someone has heard us. And I really want to thank uh, Director Pingree and Commissioner Reed and especially Governor Mills for pushing this bill through uh, because I feel finally it's a big breath of relief, but the work has just begun. We have a lot to do. So I'm ready to get to work. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. And last, certainly not least, we are going to be hearing from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute's Andy Pershing. Whoa, already spilled in the water. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. It's, it's really an honor to be able to be here and to be able to try to give something back to the state of Maine. So I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change in the ocean. And every climate change story starts with people. And it starts with this wonderful civilization that we've built that depends on lots and lots of energy. And since the Industrial Revolution, the easiest way, the cheapest way for us to get that energy has been pulling coal, oil, and natural gas out of the ground, burning it, and sending carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Of course, carbon dioxide uh, absorbs uh, infrared light, which means that the Earth is warming. So we have global warming over the, over the, uh, 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 that we're dealing with right now. Um, but now, wh what does this mean for the ocean? 
Well, 90% of the additional heat that's been added to the planet due to burning fossil fuels is now in the ocean. So the oceans are warming up. We're seeing that at all depths in the ocean, and we're seeing that really across the globe. 30% of the carbon dioxide in the, uh, that's been emitted into the atmosphere is now in the ocean, and that leads to ocean acidification. So carbon dioxide, when it dissolves in water, makes the water more acidic. It changes the chemistry uh, of the ocean, and so this is something that we're having to deal with, uh, and Bill just gave some great examples of some of the challenges that, uh, that people are facing from uh, acidification. One of the things I do want to highlight is this, it's not a new phenomenon, but I, I would say that it's growing uh, on, uh, in terms of its, the attention that it's getting in the oceanographic community, and that's deoxygenation. So warm water actually holds less oxygen. Uh, warm water also tends to float, and so it makes the ocean more stratified, and it keeps, uh, it, it, min it reduces the amount of contact or the ventilation uh, of the ocean with the atmosphere, and both of those contribute to lower levels of oxygen in the ocean. So this was highlighted in the, uh, in the recent uh, report from the United Nations IPCC that came out yesterday. These three effects were also highlighted as part of the, uh, the National Climate Assessment that I worked on uh, uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, but I'm going to talk just really quickly about, you know, about what does this mean for Maine. And one of the things that we have to do is we have to include one other process. And this was a big part of the IPCC study that came out, and that's the cryosphere, the ice on the planet. So warming, one of the big effects is that warming is changing the ice dynamics in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. Uh, Arctic melting is disrupting the circulation in the North Atlantic. And that is a big part of the warming story that we've had here in the Gulf of Maine. So we're dealing not only with the, the general global warming, but we're dealing with big changes in the circulation that affect the water masses that come into the Gulf of Maine. That changes the water temperature. It also changes the chemistry in some interesting ways that I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> So I'm going to try to ground the rest of this presentation in, uh, in the work that we did with the Fourth National Climate Assessment. So I led the Oceans and Marine Resources chapter. Part of the NCA process is to, is to try to distill for the people of the United States what are the big things that we should be paying attention to? What are the new things that we've learned over the last, in this case, the last five or six years about how climate change is going to impact things that people care about in the U.S.? And we do that by distilling everything down to we had to choose three key messages. Uh, and so I'm going to walk you through those messages and talk about how they're playing out here in the Gulf of Maine. So the first key message is around extreme events. Uh, and Bill gave a great example of that, of, of the, some of the, ch you know, the changes that we're seeing in terms of precipitation. Uh, well, we also are seeing them in the ocean. Uh, one of the ways that we see them in the ocean is with these marine heat waves. The heat wave that we had in 2012 was one of the first heat waves that was documented. The paper that Kathy Mills, who's uh, uh, with us here today, uh, and I led was the first time that heat wave was used in the, uh, in the marine literature. It was a big part of the IPCC report that came out yesterday as well. Of course, we started, in Maine, started paying attention to this, not just because the waters were warmer, uh, but because we saw the impact on the lobster fishery. So lobster were coming in uh, fast and hard uh, about a month ahead of normal. Uh, that uh, really challenged the supply chain, led to a drop in price, and created a very challenging year for lobstermen, even though uh, we were experiencing what at the time were record landings. The other way that heat waves are playing out, too, is, is with some of the wildlife and some of the individual species. Uh, there's a, been a lot of really good work lately documenting the impact that the marine heat waves that we've had in 2012, 2016, 2018, and also a little bit 2013 have had on some of the seabirds. And that really is because during these warm years, we get some unusual species that move in, uh, unusual fish species that move in, and, uh, and, and it creates a challenging feeding environment for the birds. But as Bill said, you know, a problem uh, creates, I believe, there was a great quote that, you know, a problem is just the, you know, it's just the, uh, the tool for uh, coming up with a solution. And this was a big part of the, the key message that we put around this, and that's these, these extreme events can often drive adaptation. In Maine, we saw, in response to 2012, big changes in the way that, that lobster is marketed in the state and in the way that lobster is handled and processed and investments in new processing capacity in the state in order to deal with the soft shell product. And that had a real economic impact on the state of Maine. So in 2016, when we had a very similar heat wave to 2012, we actually had higher than expected prices uh, and, and were able to, to, to derive more value out of that fishery. <clears throat> 
So the next uh, key message I want to talk about is around fisheries, which is, of course, uh, uh, important for us here in the state of Maine. Uh, so fishery management is a complicated process. But in, one of the things I love about fisheries is that it's, it's, a great, it's a great kind of microcosm for a lot of the decisions that we have to make around the natural world and how they're going to be affected by climate change. So fishery management works by, first, there are fish. Uh, we collect a lot of data. The scientific community collects a lot of data from the industry, uh, from scientific surveys. That data gets synthesized through something called a stock assessment. So we figure out how many fish there are, and we figure out how many fish are getting produced. Uh, and that allows, the, allows us to put an idea of what, the, what a sustainable harvest level is. That information goes into the fishery management process. The fishery management process then comes up with a series of rules and regulations, depending on the fishery that can be uh, diff different sorts of things that affect how much fishing takes place in the next, uh, next few years. That feeds back onto the fish. So we have a nice closed loop, what's called a negative feedback loop. And the idea is that if the fish populations are too low, we pick that up in the stock assessment, and we reduce harvest levels until that allows the fish population to rebuild. The challenge that is that fishery management is an entirely backwards facing process. We look over the last 30 years and characterize what are the average conditions for that species and what's the average productivity level. If you factor in rapid change like we've seen in this region, it breaks this process and makes the decision making really difficult. And that's a big part of the, the story of why, uh, of why Gulf of Maine cod are at the low level that they, uh, that they are right now. So finally, I want to talk about uh, uh, our, our, what was actually our first key message, and that's the one that we call ecosystem disruptions. Uh, so it's, not, it's probably not a secret. We were trying to get the people of the United States to care about the ocean, so we put a picture of a coral reef in the assessment. Uh, it's beautiful. They're also incredibly vulnerable, and we spent a lot of time talking about that. Again, many things that we were talking about are echoed uh, in the IPCC report. In our region, we have a really unique ecosystem, and it's based on a cold water community. We are at the southern limit of many subarctic species. We have a characteristic subpolar North Atlantic ecosystem here in the Gulf of Maine. We're obviously warming. Uh, the black line there, the heavy black line, shows our warming trend, which is about three to four times the global average rate over that period. Uh, so a lot of, uh, a lot of change. Um, that is impacting this guy. This is Calanus finmarchicus. It's a rice grain sized crustacean that's at the center of the food web in the Gulf of Maine. If you're not Calanus, you probably eat Calanus or you eat something that eats Calanus if you live in the Gulf of Maine. <laughs> One of the things that eats Calanus are right whales. Uh, we're seeing big challenges in right whales, reduced calf production, changes in their distribution. Uh, that's having uh, feedbacks on our lobster fishery. One of the things I'm really watching are herring. herring Reproduction is down. Herring are also calanus predators. And so we're seeing this transformation of this ecosystem right now from one that has the subarctic character to one that's going to start to resemble a more temperate ecosystem. So finally, I just want to leave you with, uh, with the actual way we wrote this key message. So we started by talking about this valuable ecosystems in the ocean and how vulnerable they are. We then talked about how ecosystem disruption is likely to intensify through these processes of warming, acidification, and deoxygenation. We talk about how warming has been the one that has been best documented so far. Acidification is a little bit further out there. And deoxygenation is, is I think, uh, also one to watch. But this last statement, I think, gets to the issue that, the, that this committee is going to deal with, and that in the absence of significant reductions in carbon emissions, transformative impacts on ocean ecosystems cannot be avoided. So we really have to do these two things. We have to adjust and adapt and figure out how to live in a world with really strong trends. But then we also have to do our best to, to, to make a world where those trends at some point stop. So thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have spent enough time right. hearing from you all that we're not going to have a quick panel. Um, but I would highly encourage you to thank our amazing presenters one more time. Thank you.
and grill them because obviously from hearing from them all for, for 10 or 15 minutes, you know they have a lot more information to share with us all. Um, every person who's presented today is going to be involved in the work of the Climate Council. We're incredibly lucky to have them as well as many other scientists in this room who are going to be contributing. So um, it's obviously important to ground our work in science. And I, I think that this uh, panel this morning as well as the stories were a great kickoff to that. Um, so we're going to give you about a 15-minute break um, so that you can uh, take a break and then we're going to come back and talk about the mechanics of the council and then hear from the governor and Gina McCarthy. Um, the one thing we want you to do before you take a break uh, for 15 minutes is introduce yourself to somebody sitting next to you who maybe you don't know. Um, obviously, this is an incredible room full of people. You're going for it. We'll see you in 15 minutes. <laughs>